we are going to start recording. And we put all of these community chats onto our YouTube channel and playlist. So I want to welcome everybody to our um, Cup of Joe for May with the focus on the FY23 budget. Uh, we have your town manager, Paul Balkeman, here with me, Brianna Sunrid. And we will be having our finance director, Sean Mangano, join us in just a moment. He's hopping over from another meeting. So while we're waiting, uh, I'd love for Paul to um, maybe give any um, updates, whether budget related or not. Uh, feel free to go ahead and get started. Sure. Thanks, Brianna. Um, so first off, it's going to be a warm weekend. Um, so we will have uh, the Groff Park spray park turned on for the weekends, which will give some relief to, to kids. Um, you know, our emergency management director is monitoring the weather. So if there's any needs that need to happen uh, in the meantime for uh, heat relief or anything, he'll be, this is, that's uh, Chief Nelson. He will be the one to address that. Also this weekend, we're really excited that our um, new DEI director and our CREST director and our assistant DEI director will all be, have all been invited by the League of Women Voters to be at Groff Park on Sunday at 3 p.m. to do sort of a very informal meet and greet. Um, our um, DEI director is here today, walking around meeting staff and meeting department heads. Um, and is relocating from another part of the country. So it's a really exciting time for us um, as we continue to build our, our capacity here. Um, the other thing that uh, I want to mention, um, we're trying to get the word out as much as possible that we have new voter locations. Many people will have new voter locations. The council approved this recently after the re-precincting. So there will be additional, um, everyone should check um, where they are scheduled to vote. If you got your census, it was written on your census form, a little tear off thing on the bottom, but so it's to make sure that you're going to the right voter location um, because with the re-precincting things changed a little bit. So when that comes uh, into play, just make sure that, that, that you're paying attention to that. And the last thing is something that, um, that uh, Brianna just put up this morning, which I think is really interesting. There's there's two things I've been really wild about. One is our webinar on bears, which if you haven't seen it, please track it down and look at it because it's it's you know they're using it in the schools. Actually, I didn't mention that to you, Brianna. Um, you know, somebody at the school said, "Oh, I want to take this show to my kids." Um, because it is, it's, there's a lot of scientific information about bears, and it's all specific to Amherst and where they are in Amherst. There's, they have a map. They track these bears. They have, they have collars on the bears, and they track them. So that one, people are sick of me talking about this, but um, that's a big one. And then the other thing I think is really valuable to the public is our town engineer making a presentation about what roads get paved and why and the sort of scientific analysis that they use. They literally drive every road in town with a vehicle that takes a 3D shot of every inch of the pavement. And then they, they calculate the condition of the road and then they factor that in with traffic counts and um, sort of um, things that happen just sort of, you know, this condition of roads that people see in general. And then they, that's how they come up with their, what roads get paved. Cause we have such limit, even though we've doubled the amount of money we put into roads over the last five years since I've started here, um, it, we still have unmet need. And so how do we choose um, how we spend our limited dollars on things that are, are uh, on the roads. And so this shows that it's very, um, it's, it's not, um, driven by somebody sitting in a room saying, or driving, oh, that, I, driving on their way home saying, I want my home road paved. It's really done through an analysis and that each each road gets a grade um, and then they do an assessment that way. So, and that's a, the presentation's like 30 minutes, the whole video is like an hour and 15 minutes, I think, Bree, you know, something like yeah. that. Yeah, the presentation's a tight, maybe 20 minutes and then there's a lot of good information in the Q&A. Yeah. Um, Yes, so really methodical and the methodology for choosing streets is included in there and you'll even learn about something that I had no idea about called alligator cracks. So yes. <laughs> if, <laughs> so tune into that, it's on our YouTube channel, it'll be on our homepage soon. Um, and it also includes what streets are planned to be done this year and next. So it's a lot of good information for yeah. those who are interested. It, so we, oh, go ahead. So I think, so maybe we can just open up, see if people have questions, non-budget questions before, and wait till Sean gets here for the budget questions. Yes, yeah, so we're, 
We're still waiting on our finance director who will be here shortly. I do see a number of you in the room. And as usual, we welcome live questions uh, by raising your hand in Zoom or by just popping your question into the Q&A function here and I can read it aloud, but we'd love to hear from you. So if you do have any general questions ahead of the budget segment, please go ahead and raise your hand or put them in the Q&A. I do see Bertie's hand. So Bertie, if you could unmute and introduce yourself. Hello, um, thank you so much for hosting this event. I was curious, I was really excited because I just saw the article in the um, Amherst Indy by the Community Safety Working Group about the idea of putting a youth empowerment center and a BIPOC cultural center at the current Wildwood building. And I was really curious if you had a um, chance to look at that or consider their idea. You know, I, I haven't. I actually, I, I, we, I've received the letter, but I haven't really looked at that deeply. And we haven't really looked at um, future uses for either Wildwood or Fort River, whichever building is chosen uh, to, it's not chosen to be the new site for the schools. Um, you know, I think we're looking at lots of different options for a BIPOC Cultural Center, Youth Empowerment Center. Last night, the TSO committee heard about the need for a senior center. Um, and this the sort of needs, I think right now where we are is doing a needs assessment for a youth empowerment center. That's sort of risen as the highest priority and we've allocated some ARPA funds to support that work um, and do some a needs assessment about what exactly what is what is the need that we'd want to be working towards and what would be the kind of facility that would best serve it. And I'm curious, how does that work intersect? Like I know a lot of, um, or some some portion of the community safety working groups charge and research involved looking at that, like what that youth empowerment center would serve. So I'm curious what the sort of additional like gap and knowledge would be that this would be aiming to fill. Um, so you know, I don't know if they the they didn't do a ton of research as far as I know into um, the actual, you know, the data that we would normally collect in a situation like this, in order for us to go to the council to, to request money, we would need to have a fair amount of data in terms of the need um, surveys that might have to be done. Um, so I think we would build on what CSWG has already put together, and then uh, go to the, you know, uh, go to the council, talked about the needs and how this fits in with our overall capital plan. Because whatever we're going to do is going to take money. Uh, it's going to take a capital investment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bertie. Thanks for being here, Bertie. Yeah. And what's the best way for Bertie to stay up to date with that, Paul? Would you recommend uh, interfacing with council council members from? Yeah, you know, um, for that we've asked our um, recreation director Ray Harp to sort of take the lead, but we re re realized that. Um, you know, he's relatively new in, in his position. So building a team around him of, of people to support his work. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think just staying in, stay in touch with us in, in our office or Ray Harp at the recreation department, that might be a good person too. Great, thank you, Bertie. So we have a question that our friend Jeff typed in that I'll read now. Um, has there been progress made in finding a new home for Amherst Media? Mm. So we, um, so Amherst Media is, you know, with our contract with Amherst Media, they're responsible for providing their, their facility. Um, we have looked at the, all the town facilities, you know, we looked at uh, the uh, former Hitchcock Center on, on West, on South Pleasant Street. Uh, we looked at the um, Hickory Ridge uh, building that's there. Uh, and we most recently uh, with representatives of the Amherst Media walked through the South Amherst School and our building commissioners doing, did a uh, assessment of the condition of that building and what it would take to be occupied. If you may recall, all three of these buildings were things that we inherited from other people, the Hitchcock Center from the old Hitchcock Center from the Hitchcock Center, you know, we bought the um, Hickory Ridge and then the South Amherst School was something that the school department um, left and then they, after they didn't use it for school purposes, they gave it to the town. And there hasn't been investment, much investment in that building since because it wasn't being utilized. So in order to reoccupy that building, it will need a fair amount of work to make it up, get it up and running. Um, so, you know, our building commissioner and assistant town manager worked with them um, last week, maybe they met this week or 
maybe I forget if it was Monday or last week, um, to find a site. The, their needs are, you know, we, we also have offered to put them in touch with individuals. I think they've already done some of this work with um, at the university and the two colleges. They often have space. And we've also forwarded some, some sites that, you know, in the, in the real estate market, and I know they're looking at a location on University Drive. Um, our responsibility is to make sure that they can have access to the internet um, and can access, you know, the, 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 the feeds that we have, the ethernet feeds that we have, and we're prepared to do that wherever, whatever their site they, they've chosen. Great, thank you, Paul. So we are still waiting on our finance special guests. I do see um, normally when we have uh, some of our counselors in the room, we invite them if they'd like uh, to raise their hand and uh, pop in and say something. So um, if you'd like to do that, feel free to raise your hand and there we go. Yeah, yeah, we try to make this as informal as possible because we're trying to replicate our, our having a cup of coffee in front of a black sheep or something. Uh, do you want me yeah. to go? I don't yes, know hi, Anna. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's nice hi. to be here. And I apologize. I do have to leave a little early, but thanks for offering it. I'm excited. I don't have anything to, to say other than thanks for doing it. And I'm what, glad everyone joined us. Well, what are you working on? What am I working on? Yeah, what are like, you thinking about? What do you think about for council? What, what's your top, top topic? Oh, my goodness. So many things. I am <laughs> uh, deep into that budget book. Um, for me, you know, I think. Paul has heard me talk about uh, our our capital inventory a whole lot recently. That's been on my mind, thinking about how we can further our, our climate goals and our equity goals through infrastructure, um, both of which are tied to those. So thinking through what does it mean to have um, more vehicles that are that are not even hybrid but actually electric, and how do we get to that point? You know, and I know Sean. Uh, told us this year about school buses, taught, taught me a lot about school buses this year um, through the budget process. Um, and then the other part that's that's on my mind with the budget is the uh, opportunities for resident engagement, specifically through, you know, the Joint Capital Planning Committee has a resident capital request, and we're working on figuring out how to make that really accessible and, and, mm -hmm. and part of our budget process, you know, that we are able to utilize. So um, I'm excited and uh, to get on into that. And grateful for town staff's willingness to put up with my shenanigans around it. So, yeah. I love shenanigans, yeah. right? <laughs> shenanigans for good. Well, thank you, Anna. And yeah, we, um, we do have Sean here joining us. So welcome, Sean Mangano. Uh, I think probably most people know who you are, but for those who don't, could you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sean Mangano. I'm the finance director. Sorry, I was late uh, hopping from another meeting. Paul left me behind um, to make sure that the meeting could finish. So sorry for being late, but happy to answer any questions or yeah, whatever, that, that, whatever probing questions have been sent out so far. Happy yeah. to dive in. So the meeting we were both at was the elementary school building committee, which I thought was, a, I don't know, we haven't checked base, but I thought it was a really good meeting, really substantive discussions about sort of narrowing down. It's really about which site do we choose and narrowing that down was, it's really interesting. People bringing lots of different perspectives to the table, um, really rich conversation, I thought. And, and just as a reminder, don't limit yourself to budget questions. If you do have a question about the school or something else, feel free. And just as a reminder for anyone who joined new, um, raising your hand or using the Q&A function would be the best way for us to hear from you. And I do see a hand in the room. So I'd love Sarah to unmute and introduce. Hi, Sarah, welcome. Hello and hello again, Sean and Paul. I was following Hi, them from meeting to meeting. <laughs> I know. <laughs> It's a busy morning, um, uh, but this is about the budget. So maybe six months ago or last fall at a finance committee meeting, I noted that um, the town regularly uh, ends the fiscal year with a surplus, and that's a good thing, and that it's the practice to budget conservatively, which is a good thing, but that sometimes the surpluses are, are I mean, they seem inevitable and sometimes they're quite large. So was I suggested that um, the team think about easing up a little bit on the conservatism. So because every dollar that's left behind was a lost opportunity, you know, to do, to pave a little more of a street or to give a little more money 
to the schools or just to do something else. I mean, it's wonderful to add that to free cash, but um, the pressures on the budget are considerable. So I wondered if there'd been any movement on that or, or how really you can gauge how conservative you're being. So yeah, no, that's a good question. You mind if I start with that, Paul? Mm -hmm. um, so I know the, the dollar amounts appear large um, because when we're talking about a $90 million budget, $85 million budget, if you have a, a 2% uh, surplus at the end of the year, it could be a million or $2 million. Um, but, but when we've looked back historically, we're sort of in that range of between one and 2% of a, of a difference between what we are budgeting and what we're, um, what we're having left over at the end of the year. And you have to remember that that's a combination of both the expense side and the revenue side. So if our revenues come in, you know, if we're, if we're conservative on revenues and they come in a little bit higher than what we budget, that a little bit gets added to our, our reserves. And likewise on the expense side, if our expenses come in a little bit less, um, then that gets added. So when you add the, the two of those, when you're really talking about two $90 million projections, um, a one or 2% surplus at the end of the year really is pretty reasonable. Um, we, but, it, but acknowledging what you said and that our reserves are at a place um, kind of where we were, our goal was, was to get them up to help support the four building projects. Um, we did do an appropriation last year from our reserves because it was a little bit of a higher year than normal. Um, we appropriated, I think it was a million dollar for roads. I think there was some money for sidewalks. Um, and there was the, the contribution to the reparation stabilization fund. Um, so acknowledging exactly what you said, Sarah, that last year I think was a little bit larger than normal. Um, and a lot of that was pandemic related. We just not knowing um, when we did the budget exactly how the university was gonna return, how quickly downtown would return. Um, we were maybe a little bit more conservative. I think the other thing that I'll say, you know, so I've been here two years now and, and Sonia Aldrich, who all of you know, has taught me a lot. Um, and, you know, town budgeting, it's, it, we can't just put whatever numbers we want. You know, we could, we could feel really, uh, really confident in a number that it, something's going to rise. But the state really reviews our revenue projections in particular. When we set the tax rate, they look at each of our categories of revenue. Um, and unless we have a really rock solid case for revenue increasing, they don't want to see it any higher than the, the year before, whatever the, the prior year actual was. Um, so, the issue that causes is there's a little bit of a lag in terms of when our revenues increase, when we can start to realize that increase. So I'd say, you know, the, the big exceptions to that are property taxes, which we, you know, we do have rock solid information that that's going to go up and, and state aid, we have the governor's budget. But I think the areas where, you know, we tend to be more conservative are on the local receipt side, where we want to see the history and the actual um, receipt of that revenue before we budget it. And a lot of that, again, is driven by the state sending that message out to us when they review our revenues and they set our tax rate. So you don't feel there is significant room or permission or uh, merit to tweaking the numbers? I think we try to, when we, so when we look at revenues like local receipts, um, which again, that those are the areas where there's probably the most, uh, the most wiggle um, because it's, it's really driven by user um, user behavior in town. Um, we look at what we've brought in in prior years. Uh, we look, we talk with departments to see if they're, you know, they're aware of something that's gonna uh, influence that number in the future. Um, and I think, again, the, we've been more conservative. You're gonna see larger revenue growth. If you've looked at our revenue growth in the budget the last two years, it's much larger than normal because we're coming out of the pandemic. So we are being a little bit less conservative because we know there's room to grow because we're, because we dropped it so much during the pandemic that we're going to come back faster. Um, I think within the next year or so, we're going to start to stabilize. We're going to kind of realize that we're out of the pandemic and back to where we were before that or whatever new level we're going to be at um, if behavior has changed. Can I ask hey. a follow on? Sure. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I looked at the, in the budget, uh, proposed budget for the, you know, outlook for the next few years or whatever, the mm -hmm. budget outlook. And it looked like local receipts were still not back to pre-pandemic levels, even in even two years hence. So it looked like a really slow recovery. And I was curious about that in particular. I mean, I you know there are new businesses starting up, but maybe total business activity is still down. I don't know. 
No, I think, again, when we go out five years, we're going to be more conservative in those out years in terms of projecting revenue increases. Um, when you look back at history, there's, there's also sometimes you have to dig into the numbers a little bit more to know if there's a one-time thing that may have made it higher in prior years. Um, there, there are a couple anomalies in some of our history where there was a, a large revenue in one year that boosted local receipts up and made it look like it was really large, but it was a one-time thing. Um, and the one that jumps out to me is our... Um, we had a health insurance trust fund issue where the, the town loaned $2 million to the trust fund to balance it for the year. And then when we did a, a surcharge and when the surcharge, um, when staff paid back that loan, that went back into the general fund and it went into, uh, into those, that local receipt section for one year. So it made it look $2 million higher than a normal year. Um, so, so there's always a little bit of variability, um, but we are a little more conservative when we start projecting out five years in terms of how quickly revenues will grow. And I, I do think, um, Sarah, that we do a little bit of a look back after the um, fiscal year closes out. We come back to the count. We can come back to the council like we did last year and look at, you know, here's how the year turned out. Maybe there's something else that can be done for the current fiscal year. So we do it. And I mean, I think conservative uh, financing is a, a good thing, um, but um, but we also have this sort of release valve of coming back in the fall to present some ideas to the council if there's additional appropriations to be had. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so I wanna just uh, prompt the, the attendees again, if you have a question, feel free to put that in the Q&A, uh, raise your hand. I don't see any hands at the moment. So I wonder if there is like a quick budget recap we can um, give or, or next opportunities that are coming up. Yeah, so, um, so finance committee meets on the 24th, is it Tuesday? Yep, 24th. The 24th. Um, and so on that meeting, the, the finance committee will be diving into the general government portion of the budget, which are a lot of the town hall departments, the town manager, town council, finance, HR um, benefits. And then they will also be talking with conservation planning and development, um, which is a good one because, you know, when, just like the previous uh, speaker mentioned, um, they actually do a lot of the ec uh, revenue generating activity um, in town, or at least in our license and uh, our local receipt section. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll be on Tuesday. And then we have at least, uh, sorry, I believe we're on the 26th as well. Um, and we are doing facilities with finance committee and then public health, the senior center and veterans will be on the 26th. And then the finance committee will start wrapping up their recommendations. So it'll, they'll meet on the 26th and possibly the 31st of May to finalize a recommendation to the council. They'll have to complete that recommendation um, by the end of May. and. And then on the 6th, we have a capital uh, improvement program forum, which is sort of like a budget hearing, but instead of it being on the operating budget, this is specific to the capital improvement program uh, where the public can come and uh, share their thoughts. And then tentatively, the council is, uh, it, it's on, I don't know if Lynn has changed this on the agenda, but um, at least previously, the budget was on the 13th of June, uh, that council meeting to be considered at least. I don't know if it'll be voted that night, but to be considered for a vote. Um, and I'll just, one thing I just wanna follow up to the previous question too, um, and maybe Sarah and you and I can talk offline. If we wanna look at that five-year projection, um, I can kind of point out some of the areas in the local receipt section for you where there were things that were in FY20 that just don't exist anymore in the future years, which is part of why you're seeing that we're not back to where we were in FY20. Um, there's just some things that aren't there anymore, um, which is why there's a little bit of a gap. And I've just welcomed Council President Lynn Griesmer into the room. So Lynn, feel free to go on ahead and introduce. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all for attending and uh, for your uh, focus on the annual budget proposal for FY23. Uh, the hearing on the capital side of the budget will be hearing or public forum will be this uh, will be on the 6th of June and the vote on the budget is scheduled uh, for the 13th, both the capital as well as the operating. Um, and I, um, I'm in the spirit of informality, um, I as a 
this person who's focused on fiscal issues for much of my career um, and now been on the council and the finance committee for four years. Um, I actually appreciate the fact that our uh, budgeting is done in a conservative manner. Uh, and I want to build on Paul's point um, that when we have some uh, surplus, if you will, at the end of a fiscal year, um, it allows us to maybe catch up on a couple things that arose during the year. So in last year, one of those, in fact, was um, reparations. And we were able to put some money into reparations. And Sean, correct me, but I think we also used some of it as an opportunity to catch up on a couple things that we had under budgeted mm -hmm. for during COVID, like the retirement funds or something like that, OPED or something. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for reminding me. I forgot. So we, we used it to make up for what we um, in previous years cut from our OPEB contribution. We, we usually mm -hmm. contribute 500,000 uh, and we had reduced that during the pandemic to help soften the blow. Um, so we restored what we had cut so that we, it, you know, it's like a, as if we had made $500,000 contributions each year. Um, and then the other thing that you mentioned, we've used it free cash for um, is to help when we, we've had some projects where the costs, partially because of just how quickly prices are rising, um, mm -hmm. has come in higher than what we've budgeted for capital projects. And the one that jumps out is, um, well, there's actually two that jump out, the, the ladder truck, um, not the ladder truck, the pumper truck for the fire department. Um, we appropriate additional funds so that that purchase could be finalized. And then the feasibility study for the elementary school, um, also the, the estimate for that was a little low. And so with the final cost for that feasibility study, we had to appropriate additional funds. Thanks, Sean. So let me also say that it, and this is maybe foreshadowing a little bit of what somebody may hear from me in the finance committee as we move on to the council. But my biggest concern this year is whether or not our present budget proposal for FY23 will seriously be able to accommodate what we're seeing in inflation. And that is the hardest thing to predict at this point. And as we looked at the third quarter reports, we've already, for this year, FY22, we've already seen um, what might be considered additional funds available no longer being available because they're being eaten up by inflation. So um, these are just the many ways that we all have to think about how we balance our budget. And we also have to think about the fact that even though we pass a budget once a year, there are financial issues that come up during the year that it is best for us to attend to at the time they come up. And that's where some of the uh, flexibility in the money year comes in handy. So thank you for being here and thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. So one thing I wanted to um, mention, we've made reference to a budget calendar, capital improvement program, all the different documents. Um, one of the best ways to engage with some of these materials and ask questions and submit your feedback to us is by visiting our budget, our FY23 budget page on Engage Amherst. Um, it's a great place to, to get linked to all these different resources, submit your questions for for Sean and the finance team to answer. And also, um, you know, after looking at the document and some of the resources, the story map, et cetera, um, submitting your feedback to the finance team, um, as well as any feedback that you might have for your counselors. So if I go on Engage Amherst and I submit a question like why, why is um, whatever it is, um, then that question goes to Sean and he responds, right? That's and then everybody and every, immediately like that. Um, and and everybody gets to see the question and the answer. So it helps it sort of creates a shared database or whatever knowledge base for everybody, which is I think that a really nice invention that we that you've in, implemented, Brie. So and there are FAQs already kind of built in. So Sean's identified and his team have identified the questions that they've been getting a lot. So they've kind of preloaded some FAQs. If you don't find your answer in some of those, um, we've got Sean wired up. So as soon as a question comes in, he gets like a jolt. So uh, feel free to put your questions there, the full bu budget calendar, all these dates that we've been talking about. Um, it's a great place to put eyes on to find all of those details. And um, we've got a question in the Q&A. This one's for Sean. How did the ask me anything go? 
So nobody asked me anything, um, <laughs> I think is, is the best way to answer. No, I, we got one question um, and this might be actually a good one to, to talk about. There was one question and um, it was that the person was asking, how can the budget change once it's been submitted by the town manager? Um, and so the uh, they, they relay that they'd heard the council can only reduce the budget, um, which is mostly true. The, the council can usually only reduce the budget. Um, and, but I did share the one exception or one of the few exceptions that might, uh, that's being discussed this year, which is around the school budget and that the council um, can by two thirds vote choose to increase the school budget if they um, choose to do so. Um, and then the only other way the budget could be increased would be if we've, or we have to submit a balanced budget. So if there were more revenues that became available, it's possible the town manager could do something, but we don't typically do that after a budget's been submitted because we won't have any more information on revenues being increased until after the state budget is voted. Yeah, and the state budget's a big piece of it because we work from the governor's budget number, which he puts out in January. And then there are other um, milestones like the House Ways and Means budget comes out and then that goes to the Senate and they work it all through and, and they don't really vote that till June. We hope it's in June um, and because it's not real until the, the legislature votes it and the governor signs the bill, so the, the budget. So we don't like sort of keeping, you know, moving numbers around based on whoever, whatever the last person said, we start with a number, hang on to it until we get a final vote by in the, and signed by the governor. Yeah, and just so people know, this year it's a little bit unusual where there's a really big gap between the House budget and the Senate budget um, in terms of the funding they're proposing. The, the House budget was marginally better for us than the governor's budget, um, very marginally. Uh, but the Senate budget was quite a bit better for us. And, you know, we're obviously advocating for the Senate version of the budget uh, because it, it did propose some significant inc increases to um, unrestrict unrestricted general government aid, which helps the town and pilot payments, which helps the town. Um, so we would like to see the Senate budget become reality. But because there is such a big gap between the two um, houses, it's unclear where they're going to settle um, when they finalize the actual budget. We got a couple of quick uh, comments in the Q&A section, a follow-up that's relevant to this topic. Can You can appropriate from reserves though, correct? Yeah, so um, once free cash is certified, we can appropriate from free cash um, and that requires a majority vote. Um, and that certification usually happens in the, um, in the fall, late, later fall. And we can appropriate from stabilization fund as well. Um, that takes a two thirds vote um, to do that. And the reason I pause a little bit is there's some uh, legislation that's being proposed that changes the, that is considering changing the, the vote quantum um, for you appropriating from stabilization funds, but it's, but it's specific to certain types of stabilization funds. Um, so I, I believe general stabilization funds, it's gonna continue to be a two thirds vote to appropriate. All right, now we've got a, a question and a comment from Julian. I recently read over our operating and capital budgets. In the capital budget, there appears to be an APD SUV from 2019 with 67,000 miles. Why is this being replaced? Is it an anomaly? It does, it does not have over 100,000 miles or over four years old as the town policy states. Thank you for all your work drafting this thoughtful equity-based budget. Yeah, I that, love that question, Julian. <laughs> That's so detailed, perfect. But but it's going to be an unsatisfying answer. Um, yeah. So, uh, Julian, that's a great question. I'm going to reach out to the police chief and um, and the officer who manages their fleet replacement, so we, I can give you a, a full response. So I'll I will email you after this meeting so that we can um, address that question. But that's a great question. Great, thank you, Julian. So I know that we're coming up on our time. Julian says, thank you, by the way. Um, we're coming up on our time, but we did get, uh, we lost Sean for a few minutes. So if there are any last uh, hands that wanna get raised to make a comment or a question or uh, last thoughts to put into the Q&A, please did do that now. 
did you already talk about the exciting stuff in the budget? Did that already ha happen? I missed the first 10 minutes, but it's a very exciting budget. I know there's, there's, Go for there's it. always- Tell us what, 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 tell what excites you about the budget, Sean. So I know there's lots of needs, right? And, and it's, it's hard saying no um, to certain things or no, we can't do it now. It's not usually a no forever, but it's a, we don't have the resources to do it now. But this budget is, uh, you know, very unique. I think it's the first time um, I don't know if it's the first time, but we're funding two new departments um, that are going to be doing really important work that's really aligned with um, direct input from the community and, and input from the council. And um, again, I know there's lots of other needs, but these are two sort of core issues to the town that are being funded in this budget. So, um, and, you know, we had to do things a little, I think that the thing we showed this year is we're, you know, we did things a little bit different to try to achieve those goals, right? We, we don't, typically allocate more to the municipal budget. We try to do the, the equal increases to each department budget, but understanding how important this, uh, the CREST program was to the town and the community, um, you know, we deviated from that this year. So I think for, you know, for all those reasons, it's a very exciting budget. We got our capital back to 10 and a half percent, which gets us, or not 10 and a half, 10%, uh, next year's 10 and a half, um, but to 10%, which has been our longtime goal. Um, hopefully nothing happens between now and next year where we have to change that again, but that's exciting. Uh, for the ladder truck, I don't know how long the ladder truck's been talked about, but you know, proposing the funding for that is, is really um, substantial. Um, Crocker Farm Gym, I know this is a minor thing for people, but the Crocker Farm Gym has been a problem for a long time because of some HVAC issues underneath the floor. Uh, that's being addressed. So I think there's a lot of exciting projects um, and new initiatives in this budget that um, we should all be proud about. Thank you, Sean, for that recap. I do see um, Sarah's hand. So Sarah, please come on in and unmute. Um, thank you for reminding us about the, all the, the new thing, the new stuff in the budget, which is great. But um, I didn't see and I may just not have looked in the right place, if the budget explains how these new programs will be funded over time, because I think that to some degree they're, they're being funded now by ARPA funds, which will disappear. So um, no, that's yeah. a great question. Can you, can you discuss that? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great, great question. So, um, so DEI uh, is, funded fully within the operating budget, two-person department. Um, if there's any changes to the size of that department in the future, it would have to be done through the regular budget process. But if a two-person uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion department is funded fully within the budget for FY23. Let, let me just tell and so, and why, how are we able to do that? One is we did not, we instead of having an economic development director, we have a DEI director and the uh, um, assistant director it used to work half time for HR and half time for the town manager. So we took those two half time positions and moved that into the DEI department. So those two positions that we had used before are not being used now. So we're sort of redeploying existing staff on those things. Right. Um, the Crest department, it's, uh, the budget funds a 10 person Crest department. Um, again, all within the operating budget. Um, if that if the size of the Crest department were to expand in the future, again, that would have to be done through the budget process, but the 10 positions um, that were identified in the reorganization plan, those are fully funded within this budget. Um, we have used, we have set aside ARPA funds for startup costs for um, the Crest program. So those are things that we view as one-time costs anyway, or, or not, maybe not one time, but maybe every five or 10 year costs. Uh, so things like potentially vehicles, uh, the, the software that they will need for reporting and, and managing um, their calls, um, outfitting the space, um, you know, if, if there's uniforms, you know, where they're still sort of working through these things, but any of those one-time costs we propose from ARPA, but the recurring costs um, are primarily within the operating budget. The um, the one, this was a question I finance committee, so it's a good one to discuss. The one uh, decision we've made that's we've said we are going to we're committed to um, beyond ARPA that we are funding with ARPA are is the addition of four firefighters. So those four firefighters we will have to work over the next few years to incorporate them into the operating budget because the plan is for them to be permanent. Um, so that I would say out of all the ARPA funds we've allocated, that's really the only place where there's a, yeah. a promise to continue funding after ARPA that we, we will have to um, plan for. 
Thanks. I could get an answer another time if, if it's time to stop this meeting, but I'm wondering where in the operating budget does the money for the 10 Crest uh, staff come from? Paul, explain the DE, DEI. Staff. Right. So, so that was, so every year, um, not every year, but each year our operating budgets go up a little bit. Um, two and a half percent is sort of our target each year. So uh, that two and a half percent, um, so that new money that was allocated to the operating budget, the things that it covered or the major things that it covered this year are um, contracted steps and colas for staff, you know, all the staff that are employed by the town. Um, and what was left over went to help fund Cress. And then the additional piece this year was that within that two and a half percent increase to the town budget, we didn't have enough to fully fund um, that 10 person Cress department. So that's why we were able to add an additional 300,000 to the municipal operating budget to get that all in there, to get the all 10 positions funded within the budget. And that rolls forward. So that 300,000 is funded by current revenues that we projected um, and that will continue. That'll be the new base for next year, which allows us to fully fund um, that 10 person department. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. And I originally thought we were at half an hour because I'm getting my, my platforms confused. So no rush. We do have um, until 1130 uh, scheduled. So uh, feel free to keep submitting your questions and raising your hands. I do have a question, a comment and a question from Bertie. Um, Bertie's excited about the emergence of Cress and the town's response to overwhelming public demand. So two questions. What have you found to be most impactful in terms of public mm -hmm. involvement in the budget? And what can citizens do that helps motivate you as officials to create these kinds of big changes? Mm -hmm. So I can speak to some of that, or at least you know my experience. Um, so one area where I feel like there was really good public input that did translate into funding was with the ARPA plan. So um, it's not the budget itself, but it's a separate separate grant program, but pretty much every allocation um, in that ARPA plan came from stakeholder input or from engaging with the public. We held several forums. Uh, we had an Engage Amherst page like, um, uh, like we'd have for the budget. We had a separate one for ARPA. Uh, there were a lot of direct conversations with stakeholders. Um, and so that really sort of set the direction for, um, for how we allocated that first round of ARPA payments. And coincidentally, and I think this makes sense, a lot of it aligns with the goals of the council as well, which makes sense that the town council's goals are probably based on what they hear from the community and what's important to them. Um, and that's also what we heard when we did the ARPA uh, session. So, um, so that's exciting. I think, you know, echoing what Anna said earlier, it'll be nice to, um, uh, we, we've funded a couple capital, resident capital requests so far. Um, you know, we've moved forward on a solar study. There was a feasibility study uh, of Fort River that was funded that way, or not, maybe it was of Crocker Farm that was funded that way. And so there've been a few projects that have been funded through that era, um, that mechanism. Um, but I, we have heard that it's a little cumbersome and, and complicated. So I'm excited to work with um, our Joint Capital Planning Committee and some of the representatives of that committee to try to make that a smoother process. Yeah, I would say what really drives us um, is the, we, we're really trying to strongly um, observe good government practice, which is the elected officials set the policy and set the priorities for the community. That gets reflected in the, um, what my job is, which is to build a budget that reflects the council's priorities. And then if I, then the council judges me through a performance review model as to whether I've been successful at doing that or not. And through their own sort of engagement with the budget during that through the finance committee process this month of, of intense meetings or through their own vote on the budget. So it all starts in the fall when we start with our financial indicator saying here's what the money looks like coming in. Um, and then the council says, great, here are the, our priorities for the coming year and the coming years. And then we listen to that very seriously. So that's the most important time we do a budget public forum at that point in time. And it really is up to the, and we hear lots of information at those things, but it's up to the council to decide which of those things they want to put into a document that says, these are our priorities for the coming year. Um, they don't get say they don't say go fund this you know thing or that thing, but sometimes they get there's some specifics to to it. Um, 
but then we try to align our budget to be in, in alignment with our public, the, our elected officials. And I think that's, and then if the elected officials are out of step with the public, then they get, they are up for election every two years. They, people, the public can say, we don't like what you're prioritizing. We want something, a different priority. So, but I think our counselors have been super responsive to community input um, and doing a really good job at listening. So I think that's, um, you know, it's an annual process. Um, but the constant engagement, I think it's a, a terrific question, Bertie, because I think it is kind of impenetrable sometimes. Um, you know, I, I was just thinking like, as, as Sean is talking about um, wh where our money or how, how we allocate local revenue receipts and stuff. And like, like what does that sound like to a normal person? Um, <laughs> it just sounds impenetrable sometimes, but I think the idea of, um, organizing and getting in front of the council during the public um, in the fall when we do that public forum is a really good way to good place to be. I'm, I'm totally going to age myself here, but it sounds like we need to do a schoolhouse rock mm -hmm. local government public finance edition. Um, that was a great, a great explainer, Paul. Thank you. So we've got a couple questions. In the chat, um, Jeff would like to know if we expect support for virtual town government meetings to extend beyond July 15th. Mm. You know, uh, Lynn and I meet with our state legislators frequently, and we talked about that last Thursday, I think, when we met with them. And and I think that in talking just to other local officials, I think there's going to be something, um, but that it, we probably won't know for a while, but we made it clear that we need to know if we can, are we going to continue in a remote format or have the ability to do that after July 15th, or is it go back to pre pandemic times in which people are all in the building? I think that um, our public, at least people who talk to me, love the Zoom meetings and don't want to lose that. Um, so um, it's, it, this is really a, a decision by the legislature. Um, Birdie seconds the Schoolhouse Rock episode, <laughs> and Julian would like to know if there has been um, a new public works site located. Um, there's been a lot of suspense within the community surrounding that. So, suspense. Any... <laughs> so we, this is something we have been working at uh, pretty aggressively. If you will recall, four years ago, probably now we did. We spent probably a year working with Amherst College to get a site uh, in, um, on, on Stanley and Southeast Street. And it was a great the big site, flat, everything, but a lot of neighborhood opposition. And so we chose to pull back from that location. Since that time, we have explored uh, several different sites uh, with property owners. Um, we've done some, you know, uh, we've done an RFP and identified four sites that way. None of them were really suitable. So the short answer is no, we do not have a site. Uh, we continue to explore different options for that, um, both internally and with the town council. Um, but we know that that's a high priority and there's urgency because we want to get both of these things moving forward. And, and a DPW is probably the hardest facility yeah. to site just because of the, the neighbor concerns, because of the, the noise and the you need a, a pretty large site because of all the activities that go on there, um, the traffic issues. And uh, it's just, you know, Again, I came from the school side, but seeing all the issues that are considered for citing a DPW, it, it's very difficult. Yeah, and if you think about it, in Amherst, you know, we want would, we want it to be an Amherst. It's an eight to ten acre site that's on vacant land that that's in Amherst. Like there aren't spaces like that very often, and so I think trying to figure that out. The other factor is, quite frankly, is zoning. It's like in many cities and towns. Uh, municipal uses are exempt from zoning, but we aren't in, in Amherst. So we have to also, as a developer of a site for a public works facility, we have to um, look at the zoning to see if it's an allowable use. So those, uh, that's what makes it uh, added, added difficulty to it. So I do see Sarah, please welcome Sarah back in and go ahead and ask your question. Well, first of all, I think TikTok is the way to go, not Schoolhouse <laughs> Rock. So you're right. <laughs> could send some teenagers your way to, to work with you on that. Um, if I could change gears a little bit um, and put my CPA hat on and ask whether any of the many town projects we've <laughs> approved for which money has been approved will, will happen 
this summer or this fall. There have been several regarding building maintenance and the in the North Common revitalization. And um, I know it takes some time to get those things off the ground, but mm -hmm. yeah. will they? Happen? So the um, do okay if I start, Paul. Um, so the North Common one, I believe the timeline, and the, Paul, unless you've heard other otherwise, is to um, is to potentially bid that out in the fall um, and get that moving later this this year. And that relates to another CPA project, um, Sarah. The the front steps. Um, I know they're trying to coordinate the front step um, project with the North Common project because how the way the North Common project will kind of abut those front steps and run into them. They want to coordinate that. So so those projects may be done in tandem uh, when that happens. Uh, I'm trying to think. Would, would that happen next? You said bid in the fall? Bid in the fall with the goal of then, Yeah, when, I think. the following the, year? I believe so, yeah, the following spring, summer. Yeah, yeah. Spring, summer. Okay. Uh, let me just pull up the list real quick. Are there any in particular you're thinking about, Sarah? Um, well, there are building, uh, like roof repairs and mm -hmm. The Munson Library. I know. I think the libraries were getting some attention. Mostly, uh, mostly the North Common and the Steps, because I figured those would go together. Yeah. And so I the, and I heard that the DPW has been doing the design, but I just didn't know uh -huh. how advanced, how far they've gotten. So. Yeah. So so we are making progress, and we hope they have some new update news on that in the relatively near future. So that will will explain a little bit why there's it's taken a little bit longer than we had anticipated um but um so it's it's a good news story so um so that that impacts the town common that as sean said that's connected to the front steps as well is inflation forcing uh reconsider reconsideration of those no how those are no, done or that's not the issue no okay okay thank you And I think, um, Sarah, one thing I'll, I'll touch base with Sonia too. I know we, the CPA committee has started a, a new process of providing annual reports um, or amended a process of providing annual reports. So, if, you know, we'll be getting those, uh, department heads will be working on those pretty soon because um, I believe they report through June 30th. So um, reporting back to C CPAC about whether they yeah, completed reporting. their projects. Yeah, or, yeah, or giving updates on where, where they're at. So maybe there's a way we can compile that at some point too. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so we are nearing the end of our hour. I think it's time for kind of a last call on questions or comments. So feel free um, if you have just a, even just a comment, you throw it into the Q&A, uh, feel free to do so or raise your hand. Yeah, I just want to thank folks for being here as well. Um, you know, it's always nice, when, especially people who are who are engaged and have um, good questions and and, um, and and great questions like, how do I get involved uh, in this process? I think that was a great question, and that it does spur us. We talk a lot about that, and we talked about doing a you know a resident academy, learn more about town government, and that was really on the front burner pre-COVID, and then we redeployed everything towards addressing COVID. But we actually just had that conversation recently with CPOs about that would be a fun thing to do. And a lot of cities and towns do it. And it's a nice way for people to learn about town government. And, you know, we're all junkies on this stuff. We, we you know, <laughs> but, but it's, it's interesting, you know. Well, I think we should also get some sort of pins or some sort of uh, badges for, for all the finance committee members who uh, completed 10 hours of meetings within a 24 hour span uh, between Monday night's council and Tuesday, Tuesday mornings finance. That's committee. right. That's um, right. Yeah. That's pretty I can impressive. get some stickers for them. <laughs> and that is actually something we talked about. <laughs> yeah. We, we did talk about that actually related to the, the Amherst 101 or the community Academy. Um, as Paul said, we were hoping to launch that and then, um, COVID, but we're, we're re dusting off that idea. Um, and hoping to maybe do something like that in the fall. And now we can do things virtually, although we'd love to be in person if we're able to. Yeah. So yeah. more to come on that. Um, Sarah says, give them donuts. <laughs> That's always a good incentive for anybody that I know. Thank you. All right. So um, again, we've got a couple of minutes here while, um, 
while we're letting people have their last comments, uh, Sean, Paul, anything you want to leave people with today that you didn't get to say yet? Um, let's see, uh, things coming up. We have um, Hampshire College having its graduation tomorrow at 11 o'clock and they're graduating. They're having a ceremony for three classes, 20, 21 and 22. Um, the next weekend, Memorial Day weekend, Amherst College is having its graduation for the 2022 class. And then two weeks later, I think they're having a, a separate ceremony for the 2020 class and congratulate Brianna, who walked at UMass getting her MPA degree on last week. So thank you. Appreciate that. And congrats to all the graduates out there. Um, and Julian wants to say he'd prefer ice cream with the warm weather. So yes, good, good segue into stay cool this weekend. Um, stay safe and check on a neighbor, um, especially if you've got some elderly neighbors um, by you. All right, so I wanna thank both uh, Paul and Sean for their time today, but especially all of you who took the time to join us. We will have this recording up shortly in our community chat playlist and um, feel free to share it with anybody who might be of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Bree. All right, thank you.